quite a few carrots here too. You know, that's pretty um, so I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Claire Carmen, today. Claire uh, got her undergraduate at Stanford and did her graduate work at Duke University. She's now a faculty member at UC Berkeley in environmental science, policy, and management. And um, I've been reading her papers for probably at least 10 years, I don't even know. Uh, we finally met uh, last fall at um, a symposium that was sponsored by the Wildlife Society called Pollinators, the Forgotten Wildlife. So uh, we, we enjoyed that seminar and that symposium. And so she's done a lot of work on biodiversity. She's done work on indicator species, reserve design, uh, pollinators specifically. And she's been very involved in some work in reserve design in Madagascar. So we should probably bring her back again to talk about that as well. She was one of the people who worked for the Xerces Society, I think, at the very beginning. So the Xerces Society is a Conservation Society dedicated to invertebrate conservation. Uh, she's worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society, and she's uh, been, as I said, uh, involved in this uh, national park establishment in, in uh, Madagascar called Mashuala. I wrote it the way it sounded, not the way it's probably supposed to be spelled. But one of the things I thought you should know about Claire, I had to put a picture up here, <laughs> is that. Uh, when she comes to do a seminar, she doesn't just give the seminar. She meets with people. Let's see if I can get this to work. And uh, when we went to the Alaska Symposium, the, the group of us said, you know, the pollinator group said, we've got to go for a walk. So we said, okay, we're going to go for a walk after our symposium is over. So this is us. Steve Hendricks there, who couldn't be here today because he's got the flu, but a bunch of pollinator people. So we decided to take a walk up to Flat Top Peak. And Flat Top Peak... Here's Claire. <laughs> Flat Top Peak didn't get flat until the very end. So anyway, uh, I, she's a woman after my own heart because she, uh, we went out skiing yesterday after her seminar. So she gets here, she gives her seminar, and then cruises out. So uh, good conservation perspectives to keep in mind. Get out there, like Edward Abbey would say, right? Enjoy the world, too. So I will um, introduce her talk. It is entitled, From Science to Action, Where Do We Stand on Pollinator Conservation? Put this picture away. I'll let you pull hers up. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much, Diane, for the introduction. I have to say that Diane was just like up that mountain so fast, and I was kind of puffing and puffing behind her. Um, but I want to thank you all for inviting me to come and speak today because it's a real honor to be invited. And um, what I'm going to talk about is. Uh, moving from science to action, because as we all know in conservation biology, we're talking about a mission-driven science, and that can cause some difficulties. Basically, where, do, where does our conservation science end, and where does our action or advocacy begin? Can we do both? I know that this is a question in all the <coughs> classes that I teach. It's always a question. Can we do both? So I want to explore that a little bit. and. I'm going to borrow a page from um, Jane Lubchenco, who is really a leader, I feel, in uh, environmental sciences and, and in ecology. Uh, and she has suggested that this is the role of science uh, for, um, for our work. And I should just stop for a moment. Can you all hear me in the back? OK, great. Um, so basically, what she has said is that we need to document <coughs> change. We need to evaluate the consequences of changes. And then we need to develop and evaluate options. And this seems like a very sensible agenda for science, for science um, to me in environmental policy. Um, so in other words, through these three steps, we can provide and communicate information about choices that affect the environment. So we can still do our science in a pure way um, and present these different choices and options without compromising the science. So what I want to do today, using pollination as a sort of example, is ask where we're at in these three um, steps. And I'll do this at two scales. First, uh, I want to review um, globally you know, what people have done, and um, so where we are in this, in this trajectory. And then I want to go to a, a place-based case study from my own work. So here I'll be mostly talking about other people's work, and then much more briefly, I'll talk a little bit about my own work. So first, just to give you a bit of background on pollination 
services in general before we get into really the synthetic review. Um, so why are they important? They're important because animal pollinators provide uh, a lot of our food resources. Uh, they're important for production of more than 75% of some of our globally um, economically important fruits and vegetables and collectively um, provide up to 35% of the human food supply. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. In terms of wild plants, um, they're important for 60 to 90% of the angiosperms, depending on which author you consult, but also to some extent depending on which habitat or environment. But they're, they're found to be a limiting factor for reproduction in many natural plant populations. And um, via uh, supporting natural plant populations, then of course they're also contributing not just to food supply, but to other ecosystem services uh, that rely on uh, vegetation and on plant populations. So who are the pollinators? Well, they're a diverse crowd, um, including bees, moths, butterflies, flies, wasps, hummingbirds, bats, beetles, thrips, and they've actually, um, they're about to be commemorated in a U.S. stamp. Um, that stamp is going to be available during National Pollinator Week. <laughs> so go to your post office and buy those stamps. Um, it's kind of exciting, but definitely pollinators are uh, getting onto the agenda. They, they actually got onto the congressional agenda in order to designate the National Pollinator Week, and that's because there is a lot of advocacy going on, going on um, because there are a lot of both scientists and conservationists and the public at large concerned about whether there is a pollinator crisis and what that could mean. So I emphasize bees here um, as one of the most important pollinator groups, and I just want to take a brief moment to say why they're so important. Uh, as a pollinator group, and the main reason is because bees, um, it, it's because of the biology of bees, um, they are pretty much the only pollinator, except for a couple of butterfly species, that actually go out of their way to collect the pollen. They're not just going after the nectar, they're collecting the pollen to bring it back uh, to their nests uh, for larval food. And as a result, they have um, lots of specialized pollen collecting morphologies. And here you see a bee that's just <coughs> covered with pollen. That's its scopa, the pollen carrying basket. But you also see that there's pollen all over the bee. Because um, the, the bee is, this, in this particular case, the bee is very furry or hairy and it has um, all of those hairs are actually attractive to the pollen. And another reason that bees are often very good pollinators is because of their foraging behavior. Um, they often can exhibit to greater or lesser degrees some floral constancy, that is moving between flowers of the same species, and thus um, serving to pollinate uh, those flowers. So um, I will talk quite a bit, not exclusively, but quite a bit about crop pollination. So I just want to also, as a way of background, bring up a distinction between two types of pollinators that might be pollinating crops. Uh, because we do have commercially managed pollinators, like the honeybee, um, that we actually that farmers um, or beekeepers can actually bring to farm fields to provide pollination. And there's just about a dozen such species around the world. Um, and of those, far, by far the most important is the honeybee, Apis mellifera, which is now um, virtually utilized virtually everywhere. Um, and then we have our wild pollinators, um, which include not just bees, but other species as well, as I, as I noted. But of bees, there's about 20,000 bee species uh, worldwide, and we don't know how many might be crop pollinators, but there could be on the <coughs> order of hundreds to thousands of species of wild bees that are involved in crop pollination. So I just want to make that distinction, um, because these are not being managed, these are just available in the environment, and these are being managed or actively brought to fields for crop pollination. So. Um, that concludes the brief introduction, and now I want to start talking about what we know, what kind of changes have been documented as far as um, pollinators, and is there a pollination crisis? Just recently, um, a couple years ago, um, there was a, a National Research Council uh, group formed to evaluate the status of pollinators in North America, and I was actually a member of that group. 
Um, one of the things that we recognized very early in the process of producing this document, which is available online but not yet as a printed document, the printed document will come out in a couple months, but one of the things we realized very early on is we had very little information with which to document the status of pollinators in North America, um, as, uh, in particular with which to document the status of wild pollinators in North America. No ready databases existed that would allow us to do that in any kind of comprehensive way, although we were able to say something about endangered <coughs> species and threatened species. But one source of information was very clear, and that is uh, concerning the managed bees. The U.S. Um, supply of honeybees uh, has diminished since 1950. A lot of this is due to this uh, drop right here. A good component of that drop is due to um, an invasive species called the Varroa mite, which um, has transmitted, has weakened colonies and also transmitted diseases to honeybee colonies and has greatly increased the cost and difficulty of beekeeping. And so it's also caused some beekeepers to leave the industry. So that's one of the reasons why this decline has occurred, um, but there are other reasons as well. Another thing that was documented in this report is that not only has there been a gradual trend toward decreasing numbers of honeybees available for crop pollination, but there's also a lot more volatility from year to year and even within years in the supply of honeybee colonies. So that's certainly of concern to growers uh, in this country who depend on pollinators um, for, uh, depend on honeybees for crop production. It's also not isolated to the United States. It's also um, something that's happening worldwide. In Europe, they've done a better job of assessing what's happening with wild pollinators. And they've done this chiefly by assembling data from museum collections. And unfortunately, this figure is a little bit light, but you can just barely see the outline of, of uh, Britain here and the outline of the Netherlands down here, two countries which have been assessed. And what they did was, using these museum uh, records, was to <coughs> assess, um, they used 1980 as a cutoff point, and they assessed species richness on a 10 kilometer grid. So each little square here is a 10 kilometer grid. <coughs> and they, accept, they assess change in species richness between um, before 1980 and after 1980. So red up here means a large negative change in um, species richness, and blue, the dark blue, means a large positive change. And then what they did is, um, using statistics, they found that statistically uh, there, wa there were many more squares declining in species richness for bees um, in, in Britain and also in the Netherlands. However, for surfeit flies, another uh, important group of pollinators, uh, there was mostly either no change or actually increasing species richness for those groups. And that was recently published in Science. I just also want to mention <coughs> the ALARM project, which is an EU-funded, uh, European Union-funded project um, that is currently in place across many countries in, in Europe. I forget how many, but it's something like uh, 15 or so different countries. It's a very, very large project, and one of the things they're doing is a, is a coordinated monitoring of pollinator uh, populations and pollination function mm -hmm. to selected crops um, across this uh, wide array of countries using standardized methodologies. That's the sort of thing that we actually needed uh, to already have in order to answer the question um, for the National Research Council project, but that we didn't have. But in Europe, they're already doing that, which is really um, exciting and also uh, kind of inspiring. Um, <clears throat> so returning back to the, the Beesmeyer et al. paper, um, they also looked at what was happening with plant groups. Um, and they found using another data set, which looked at population change, and dividing plants by their breeding system into insect po insect pollinated plants versus wind or water <coughs> pollinated plants versus mostly self-pollinating, what they found in the United Kingdom was that there generally was a negative change in plant populations for this group um, and much less negative <coughs> for the mostly self-pollinating and actually positive for the, um, for the outcrossing species. <coughs> 
Um, in the Netherlands, they didn't find a, a trend. They only found a trend, not a significant result. But when they looked just at bee pollinated plants, then they did find a very similar result to what was found in the United Kingdom, which makes sense because um, in the Netherlands, the bees are declining, but the surfeits are definitely not declining. <coughs> so looking at um, plants, just the bee pollinated plants, um, they, they, did, they do see a signal. Now, obviously, this is just a correlation, um, but it's an interesting correlation that uh, plants that you would expect to be at greatest risk are also um, apparently declining in population size, and plants that you wouldn't expect to be at risk due to pollinator loss are not. Definitely would need some more follow-up work, though, to draw a tighter causation. So now I want to turn to another study, I think a really good study, um, and don't worry about how complicated this is, I'm going to walk you through the important parts. Um, but this is a meta-analysis looking at um, taking 90, over 90 studies that have been done on the effects of habitat fragmentation on plant reproduction. And the response variables that they used in this study were fruit or seed production. And basically what it shows is that over all the 93 studies, there, was a, there is a very strong negative effect of habitat fragmentation on plant reproduction on one of these response variables. So this is the mean effect over all those studies, and, and then this is the 95% <coughs> confidence interval um, for all studies then. And then they dove into those results a little bit more to um, understand a little bit better my, what might be going on. And one interesting thing is that concerning the breeding system, um, it turns out that there is a, a significant difference in the effect on self-incompatible versus self-compatible plants that were studied. Um, so self-incompatible plants, not surprisingly, are much more affected um, by habitat fragmentation than self-compatible plants. But there was no difference between uh, plants with uh, generalized plants versus specialized. That means generalized or specialized in response to pollinators, so generalized plants having many pollinators versus few. Um, and then that these two results carry through into here. So specialized, um, uh, specialist and generalist species don't differ for self-incompatible, but self-incompatible has a much stronger effect, again, than self-compatible, which is the result we saw up here. Um, there's some variation between different life forms in the effect, but another really interesting thing is that the effect is strong no matter what habitat type you consider. And continuing um, with this study, they next looked at habitat eff fragmentation effects on plant pollination in particular, because um, effects on plant reproduction uh, could operate via pollinator, but also might operate via other factors, like plant <coughs> population size or many other factors that could be at play. So what they tried to do then was to isolate to what extent the habitat fragmentation effects on plant reproduction were due to the pollination component of reproduction. So here, as response variables, they looked at pollinator visits, pollen loads, or pollen tube formation. And they did some work to make sure that there was consistency between these different response variables. Um, and so these are 52 of the prior 93 studies, the 52 studies that had also reported this type of response variable, as well as the fruit or seed set response variable. Um, and they found very, very similar conclusions for these 52 plant species. Again, self-incompatible being much more significantly affected than self-compatible. But note that for this group of species, all of them are, are significantly <coughs> negative or less than zero. So the effect of habitat fragmentation on plant, pollina plant pollination is important for both, can be important for both self-incompatible and self-compatible species. Um, going on down, uh, again, variation between different life forms. And again, for habitat type, uh, all of these different habitat types that were studied um, all showed significant negative effects of habitat fragmentation on plant pollination. And finally, again, for the same study, they correlated the effect size found for these 52 studies, actually 50 studies, um, 
<coughs> between uh, the effect size for reproductive, the reproductive success and the effect size <coughs> for pollination, finding a very, very strong correlation. Um, and thus their conclusion is that when habitat fragmentation affects plant production, sorry, affects plant reproduction, it may indeed be acting via pollination. So all of this really um, supports at a very sort of um, synthetic, in a very synthetic way, um, the importance of pollination um, in uh, this major habitat type disturbance, habitat fragmentation. And so that uh, supports the notion that we should be concerned about uh, pollination function as a result of habitat fragmentation. So I want to move on now to some work that's in progress. Um, it's being conducted um, by an NCS working group that I'm a part of, and the lead um, author on this is Taylor Ricketts. Um, and what we're doing here is now looking um, to ask the question, what about pollination services to crops? Now, I should just probably mention that this previous study that I talked about um, is not crop related. Those were all wild plants. Again, we were talking about 93 wild plant population um, studies, um, and then 50 of those studies that also included pollination. So that's what I mean by it's a very synthetic approach to be able to combine results from so many different studies and come up with, I think, a very powerful result. So for the crop pollination, we have a lot fewer studies to work with. So um, that is actually a bit of a problem, <coughs> as you'll see in a moment. But um, they comprise 16 different crop species in 10 different countries um, and 23 <coughs> studies, some of which are published, some are not. And you can see the locations um, of those studies there. So here we're taking a different approach. It's a modeling <coughs> approach um, rather than a meta-analysis approach. And so what we're trying to do is actually bring together all of the data into a common framework using hierarchical Bayesian analysis. And don't ask me to tell you how that actually works because I don't think I could. Um, but basically what we're <coughs> trying to do is model um, pollination services um, or bee uh, abundance or bee richness on this axis against distance from natural habitat for these different crops. And in other words, all of these crop studies uh, measured the relationship between where the field was, <coughs> where the study was done, and um, the relationship to uh, distance to natural habitat. So what we're, what we're essentially doing is modeling an exponential decay function. And the important param parameter here is beta. Beta could be um, slightly negative, in which case it would just be um, almost a, a flat curve or just very uh, gradually sloping. Or if it's large and negative, it would be an abrupt exponential decline. And this just shows the results. This is not the hierarchical Bayesian analysis, <coughs> but this is just simple <laughs> regressions fitted for each of the studies. And as you can see, some of them are very flat. Um, some of them uh, exponentially declining, and some of them even increase. So, and that's really the goal of these kinds of, uh, this kind of work, either meta-analysis or this, this kind of modeling approach that brings everything together, is what is the whole picture that you see um, out of all of these different studies with their disparate individual conclusions. So when you put all that data together, into a, the hierarchical Bayesian modeling framework, then what you see is a, actually a very steep um, negative uh, exponential curve. And this gives the 90% credible intervals. It's, it's equivalent to a confidence <coughs> interval, but for this kind of Bayesian work. And here on the, um, the response variable that we're looking to is the abundance of visitors, of, of native uh, pollinators um, against distance. And <coughs> Using this kind of approach, then we can get an idea of what the shape of this curve looks like, um, any thresholds, et cetera. And here we see that um, the point of 50% decline, so 50% um, visitors here, is at about 740 meters. Um, and then this is the interval corresponding to the 90% credible interval here. Sorry, it's up here. So that's what we see for visitors. 
And the results for pollinator richness were very similar, so I won't show those to you. What about for fruit or seed set? The, the real, so not just the pollinators, but the consequences of um, pollinator visits, which should be pollination function. Well, this shows here the distribution of betas um, that we get from modeling all of this d data together. And as you can see, the majority of the betas are less than zero. However, the cumulative probability here, the probability that beta is less than zero, is collectively 0.84. So that is not a significant result. It would have to be something like 0.95 or less um, for this to be considered to be, for beta to be considered to be significantly less than zero. The mean beta is just slightly less than zero. And so we get a very, very shallow curve. Um, and the point of 50% decline is at, is at uh, 14 kilometers. So it doesn't seem like a very uh, significant effect of um, pollination um, actually uh, with distance. So not a, not a significant effect of distance from natural habitat on pollination function, even though there was a very significant effect of distance on pollinators. So no overall decline detected. Um, what are some of the reasons for this? We have been a bit baffled by this and wondering. Um, well, for one thing, we only have 14 studies, not 23 studies, as in the previous work, because not all the studies actually reported on pollination function, that is, on fruit set or seed set. Some of them only reported on visitation. Um, another reason is that some of the crops are self-compatible, and so they're not necessarily going to show a strong response to pollinator function. With self-compatible crops, you often get an increase with bee visitors or with pollinator visitors, but you don't, um, it's not as clear cut. You, so you might get a milder uh, improvement with pollinator visits. Another problem is that uh, <coughs> some of these crops, there are not only the wild pollinators, which would be responding to distance from the natural habitat or might be responding, to distance from the natural habitat, but there also are uh, commercially available honeybees in the system, and so uh, these are not differentiated. Whereas with pollinator visits, we can differentiate between honeybees and other bees, and so it's easy to separate out those two. And then finally, we're dealing with no noisy data. Sorry, noisy, noisy data um, with different methods used for actually evaluating pollination function, and so. The end conclusion is that uh, there's mo we really need to have more studies on this um, and measuring yield. <coughs> so just to summarize this component of documenting change, uh, commercial honeybees are in decline. There are, there are in some areas of the world documented declines <coughs> of wild pollinators and correlated declines of pollinator dependent plants, although we can't establish causation between those. Um, but for habitat fragmentation studies, this meta-analysis is quite clear in that it depresses uh, both plant reproduction and pollination function. Um, we find that while crop pollinators decline in abundance and richness with distance from natural habitat, but there's no unambiguous translation of that to pollination services at, uh, uh, with the data that we currently have. Okay, this is just to wake <laughs> you all up right now. Um, Okay, and moving on to the next thing, consequences of change. I would say that they're largely unknown. And in some ways I want to identify this as a gap and hope that this will stimulate those graduate students who haven't yet got projects to take some on. Um, so, or if you're going on to a postdoc, there's plenty of room too. Uh, <coughs> so the, one of the consequences, of course, could be for food production. And so I just want to go into what we uh, some recent results that have compiled the importance of, of pollinators um, for food production on a global scale. And this is work by Alexandra Klein. It's also part of our NCS working group. Uh, and so this shows for 99% of the food produced worldwide from the FAO data source, um, of course there's a large component that um, doesn't require <coughs> pollinators, uh, our staple grains and that sort of thing. Um, but about 35%, I believe it is, um, require or can benefit from, pollin from pollinators. 
I, either those that we directly consume, um, those in which um, we need them for seed production, even if it's the vegetative parts that we consume, like carrots, for example, um, or those in which we need them for breeding, uh, even though we might not actually consume the seed or the vegetative parts. <coughs> and then there's a small component of plants that are actually um, they're not, not known, uh, the extent to which they may depend on pollinators. So then drilling down into this information, this part of the pie a little bit more, these are the directly consumed fruits and seeds <coughs> for fruits and vegetables of economic importance, uh, then the, you can see that there's <coughs> actually a lot of variation within that in terms of the extent to which any of those species actually depends on pollinators. So we have 13 species that uh, must have animal pollinators to get pollination. Uh, and then um, a number of different of species with different levels of dependence. So um, we define the high level as, of dependence as, as fruit or seed set increasing by 40 to 90 percent with pollinator visits, medium 10 to 40 percent increase, and little with less than 10 percent increase. So that's actually what we know. And when you think about it a little bit, there's an awful lot we don't know. Um, so we can't actually say exactly how much of the meal you just ate at lunch depends on pollinators, because we need to know a lot more. We need to know <coughs> um, what you ate, for one thing, but we also need to know what were the cultivars that um, were actually used to produce that particular tomato. And then we need to know, does that particular cultivar, um, is it in the 40 to 90 percent category or the 10 to 40 percent category? Um, and we don't know that for most uh, for most things. We we don't know much about the varietal differences um, between um, the differences between varieties within crops. And so, a lot of this sort of vagueness here is probably due to those varietal differences. Um, we also don't know, in terms of yield effects, what kinds of interactions there might be with other inputs and field conditions like water, nutrients, pests. Um, and as a result of that, um, we really don't know how yield effects at the plant scale translate to the field scale. Most of the studies that have been done, the 23 studies I, or the 14 studies that I mentioned, those are at the plant scale. And it's very rare that we have field scale data too. So that's a big need is to try to understand can, uh, if you can get data at the plant scale and also at the field scale, what kind of correlations do you find between them? Another aspect of consequences is that we don't know what kind of uh, flexible farmer behavior <coughs> might occur if there was, for example, um, catastrophic loss of pollinators. If all of a sudden we had no honeybees um, tomorrow, or um, uh, yeah, if all of a sudden we had no honeybees tomorrow, that, that would be a big shock um, to agricultural production. How would farmers respond? Well, we can imagine how they might respond, and many of them would probably shift to crops that were less pollinator dependent. Um, so there, there would be, uh, it's not like our food supply would drop out uh, necessarily, but a lot of food types um, would be affected. And the response of a farmer is, is likely to be context dependent. Um, it will depend on what kind of crops they're growing, how dependent those crops are, um, and those varieties are to uh, uh, pollinators. It would depend on their landscape. To what extent um, they, uh, which relates to the next point, uh, where are they in the landscape? Are they near natural habitat? Are they near some sources of uh, wild pollinators or not? Uh, it would depend on their farm management practices. Um, are they in a very diversified farm that supports a lot of wild pollinators or not? And so that relates to this, this point. Are they depending primarily on commercial versus wild pollinators? <coughs> that would affect their response. Um, and how much at the margin of production are they? Um, are they making a lot of profit so they have some room to play with, you know, getting the, those expensive honeybees in um, if the honeybees um, decline rapidly? Or are they so close um, to, so that they have such little margin to spare that they really can't do that and they would have to shift to a pollinator um, independent crop? So. There's a lot of things we don't know about how farmers might respond to changes in availability of either commercial or wild pollinators. 
And then finally, um, we don't really know too much about the nutritional effects. Um, how shifts away from pollinator dependent foods might alter um, our own nutrition. Uh, we do know though that some of the most pollinator dependent uh, plants are important sources of some of our micronutrients like vitamin C for example. And that's another project, another NC's project actually is working on this right now to try to evaluate um, taking the list of pollinator dependent crops and the levels of dependencies and then seeing what um, proportion of different um, vitamins, for example, micronutrients do we get from these different plants. So that's a different way of valuing um, pollinators um, and their importance to us in nutritional terms. But because of all this, we can't really predict what would happen to the human food supply if there were a, cat a catastrophic loss of honeybees and or wild pollinators tomorrow. Um, we lack the fundamental information um, for policy change because I think the policymakers would like to know, we, they would like us to be able to say, this is what would happen. Um, but we can't say that. We don't really have that information. Um, and I would argue that this is true for many other ecosystem services also. And so there is a big uh, knowledge gap. We have a knowledge gap um, that means that we can't um, quite get to the level of information, we can't provide the level of information that's really needed um, for, for policymakers at this point. So now I want to turn back to uh, wild plant populations again. Um, and I've talked about a little bit of this already, so I'll rush through the first couple of points. Um, that many plant populations are, are limited by, by pollinators in the wild, that's a result from meta-analysis. Um, the other result I also showed you that habitat fragmentation depresses plant reproduction, especially in self-incompatible plants, um, and it's linked to pollination. Um, but it's also true that most plant species are buffered from pollinator extinction. And why is that? Well, the first reason would be that uh, many plant species have alternative <coughs> reproductive strategies. If they don't get pollinated, then maybe they're going to reproduce in another way through a persistent seed bank um, or uh, vegetatively. So it's not, uh, I don't think that we can say if these pollinators go extinct, the plants are going to follow um, immediately. Um, another aspect is redundancy, and I'll go into that in some detail in a moment. Uh, and then there are aspects of the way that plants and pollinators um, are linked to one another, sort of the food webs or um, the plant pollinator webs that also protect um, plant species from pollinator loss, pollinator extinction. So I'll go through those results right now. <coughs> so the first thing is that in general, plant pollinator webs tend to be highly redundant. And this shows one web. Um, showing it's broken out because it, there's so many interactions. Um, these are, uh, this is a group of bees, the anthophorid bees. Um, and these, this is a bee species and shows how it's linked to all these different plant species. Um, these are, this is a group of flies um, showing in those linkages. And then a group of um, sphingid moths. Um, and you can see that um, most of the plant species are, visit, are being visited by many, many insect species. Um, there aren't very many one-to-one -one relationships most of the one-to-one -one relationships that are occurring are in this group here. Um, so in this case, only 11% of mm -hmm. plant species have only a single um, uh, visitor species. So taking this data set, um, Mehmet, Jane Mehmet and Nick Wasser um, simulated the loss of pollinators from two known plant pollinator networks, the one I showed you and another one. And what they did is um, first they randomly removed pollinators, um, and they did this 300 times, and then asked the question, um, how many plants lose all their linkages? Um, and then they did it in two deterministic ways. Um, the first way, they removed the least linked pollinator to the most linked pollinator. So the, they removed the single, the pollinators that were visiting only one plant species first, and then moved on up to those that were visiting many. And then they did it the, in the opposite direction, removing the most linked to the least linked. And these are the results that they got. Um, this is for the data set that I showed the web for. And this is another data set. And very, very much comparable between the two data sets. Um, first, let's look at the random one, which they did 300 times. And um, the main um, important thing uh, here we're looking at 
the percent of plants that get visited as pollinators go extinct. And what you can see is that um, most plants continue to get visited even up to like 80% of the pollinators being lost <coughs> with a random removal. Um, so that shows there's a lot of buffering capacity um, because of the redundancy. Um, however, it may not work that way. It, could not, it might not be random loss. Um, it could be least to most linked, and that, would, that might be what you might expect because um, uh, these might be the, the sort of the rarer, be, uh, rarer pollinator species being lost first. And then there's even more redundancy. But if there was the most to least link, then you'd have um, virtually a linear decline um, in the um, percent of plants that were getting, uh, that, would, that would still be visited. <clears throat> and then I wanted to mo mention a bit about this topology aspect as well. And this is also um, from that same data set. And this, again, shows least to most linked plant species. Um, and so each one of these dots represents a plant species, and then it represents um, how many, um, it, and then down here represents the pollinator species, and these are the least to most linked pollinator species. So um, this is a uh, plant species down here that is not very linked um, and is um, being visited by a pollinator species that's not very linked. And then, but the same plant species is also being visited by several pollinator species that are highly linked. So each of those dots represents a, a single plant with a single pollinator. And you can see that the, the density of points are up here. Um, and if you ran this through um, various programs, you could find out that this is a, nest, a nested arrangement. Um, and so what that means is that plants that tend to be um, to have few pollinator species down here tend to be mostly visited by pollinator species that are, are linked to many plants um, and vice versa. So pollinator species that um, don't visit many plants down here uh, tend to visit plants that are linked to many pollinator species. So in other words, specialist pollinators visit generalist plants and generalist, uh, let's see, and specialist plants are visited by generalist pollinators. I hope I did both sides of that. Um, there we go. Plants with few pollinators tend to have generalized pollinators. That's what I was trying to say. Um, and that result has now been generalized. Again, through a meta-analysis, um, they found this to be generally true. <coughs> but so for consequences of pollinator loss for wild plants, again, what we don't know. Um, well, we have these three predicted scenarios. They're fairly different from one another, um, and we don't know which one of them is most likely to occur in nature. Uh, in order to do that, we need to know something about how pollinators actually are lost from the system and then how that ramifies through to webs. So we need some empirical studies of that. Um, there are also some alternative scenarios um, that were not considered with those simulations. For example, what if whole guilds of pollinators were lost uh, simultaneously, which is not too unlikely if guilds of pollinators responded similarly to environmental conditions. So um, that might tend to reduce the buffering effects of redundancy. For example, if all the bumblebees were lost, and that's not a ridiculous scenario. Um, in Europe, a lot of bumblebees are being lost, and in this country, uh, bumblebee, some bumblebee species seem to be particularly at risk. So if all the bumblebees were lost, then um, a certain, the groups of plant species that they visit um, might suddenly really lack a lot of pollinators. Okay, so we get to the third aspect, developing and evaluating options. Well, although we didn't have a whole lot of data, um, we were still able to come up with a lot of options. Kind of interesting how we were able to do that. Um, and um, so for commercial bees, we identified uh, a number of things that could be done to help to, um, to protect the honeybee supply. And one of them would be uh, develop a honeybee breeding program uh, for disease resistance. And that would be for resisting a number of different diseases as well as resisting the varroa mite infestation itself. And these are detailed um, in this report. Um, also, developing an IPM 
program for mites uh, to help the problem that mites are, are, have evolved resistance to the pesticides that are used to control them. <coughs> uh, and also develop alternative commercial pollinators to spread the risk of relying only on the honeybee. And for wild bees, we came up with a whole suite of activities um, to encourage farming uh, and land use practices in general that would encourage pollinators to persist on the landscape. Um, and one of those is restoring pollinator habitat. Um, there's also several modeling efforts that are ongoing um, to try to investigate our options in a bit more detail. And some of these are at a very conceptual level. Uh, there are some additional meta-analyses besides the ones that I've mentioned to you. And these are essentially feeding into uh, the development of a spatially explicit model which we hope will be informative about um, targeting exactly what types of interventions and where interventions should occur. So I'll go over those kind of briefly right now. Um, the first thing is um, to talk about um, the, a conceptual sort of spatial model, which is of course very important for these organisms because they're mobile organisms. And when we're thinking about um, them on a landscape, <coughs> let's say a mixed, um, a mosaic landscape that inc includes agriculture uh, and natural habitat. Um, we're thinking about them really as uh, either nesting right here, um, but gaining resources from the area in which they forage, or nesting somewhere here and foraging um, over here where we might actually detect them. So these are moving through space. And is it really 10 to 1? It is. Okay. <laughs> okay, too much. I put too much in the seminar. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip that one and that one. <laughs> <laughs> that is just, I mean, I wasn't going to go through it anyway, but that's just to say that we're doing this stuff. You know, there's the point. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and this is the end goal, which is the important thing that we're trying to develop uh, spatially explicit maps of the supply and demand for services. Um, so given different types of landscape configurations, farm management practices, and crop types, we could put in this different types of information and be able to say something about um, what kind of services you might expect under different land management, um, uh, different land uses, and different ways of managing the land for or against pollinators. Okay, so I do want to just briefly talk a little bit, um, to ground this a little bit in a, in, um, a case study. And um, for anyone who was at my seminar yesterday, I talked a lot about the changes that we have already documented and observed. Um, so I'm, I, I will go through this quite rapidly, and really because I want to talk mostly about um, this, developing and evaluating options, because <coughs> that's sort of where we're at right now. So we're doing this on a number of different crop species um, in a landscape that consists of um, largely natural habitat on this side, the intercoast range of California, um, some narrow valleys that um, have farm sites, and then the Great Central Valley, which is pretty much, um, as you say here, ditch to ditch um, agriculture, and a lot of it is um, heavily intensive, conventional, um, uh, heavily pesticide using agriculture. And um, natural habitats include riparian and um, oak, um, oak woodland and chaparral habitat. <coughs> so documenting change, we've looked, um, we haven't documented change over time, we've instead documented change over space. So looking across this gradient from the more natural habitat types, uh, or the farms near natural habitat to the farms far from it, and generally, let, um, some of the farms up here are less intensively managed, um, but less intensively managed farms, organic farms, are scattered across here. Um, similarly, the conventional farms are, are scattered across here as well. Um, and so I just want you to sort of look at these pictures. These are just different uh, crops that we've studied, um, different studies that we've done. And there's a general similarity between the studies. Um, we tend to see a lot more <coughs> um, highly abundant uh, be communities more, more diverse as well, um, near the natural habitat down here and, and up here, and then uh, much less diverse out into the Central Valley. Um, and as a result, we can actually make a prediction about how much natural habitat you would actually need in order to be able to supply 
the pollination service from the wild bee populations alone, not um, needing honeybees. And this is for watermelon. Um, you need about 1,000 pollen grains uh, uh, per flower to get a marketable fruit. Um, and that means that these farms over here um, that are very near to natural habitat, a high proportion of natural habitat in the surrounding several kilometers, um, they don't need honeybees. They don't, and the farmers indeed do, do not bring out honeybees um, to those farms. Um, but there's a wide variety down here um, of responses, and that is most likely due to the local site conditions. Uh, and in general, uh, it seems that organic farms um, that provide a diversity of floral resources um, on, on their farm <coughs> sites are um, providing more resources for bees and are having more, uh, more and more diverse bees um, on their farm sites. So I'm actually going to skip that one for the lack of time um, and talk about, uh, about the consequences a little bit. So we know that this, uh, the distribution of natural habitat in the landscape is important. We know that the farm management practices on site are important as far as determining what, um, um, what kind of pollination services are available from wild pollinator communities. So what we're doing right now um, is a model, um, which is a, um, an economic model, and we're trying to incorporate the spa spatial heterogeneity that we have in the magnitude <coughs> of the wild pollination service I didn't show you this, but there's also um, heterogeneity in the variability of the wild pollination service. Again, as communities are more diverse, variability in the service that they supply re is much less. And so the variability in the wild pollination service is much less closer to the natural habitat uh, or on farms that have high diversity bee communities um, because of site management. We're also trying to incorporate the fact that there's uncertainty in the honeybee supply um, over time, um, and that farm, farmers' choices are going to respond to where they are in the landscape. They might make different choices if they could rely on um, being close to natural habitat um, versus not. And they might make different choices depending on their neighbor's activities. If their neighbor is going to farm favorably for pollinators, then they might also farm more favorably for pollinators. On the other hand, if their neighbor is going to use a lot of pesticides, then they might be um, not willing to try a risky approach. It's going to depend on their type of crop and their own level of risk aversion. And do they want to try to minimize the risk of depending on honeybees so exclusively? And finally, on the costs and benefits of the management techniques to be implemented, um, which would include the benefits not just from pollination, but from other services like management of water um, or uh, pest control. <coughs> and so s just to give you an example, some examples, um, there is a whole menu of choices that farmers could pick from. Um, some are much are simple and some are more complex um, that might benefit pollinators in particular and of course would have different effects, positive or negative, on some of the other services. And uh, for example, for floral resources, they could switch from monoculture to multi-cropping. Um, they could utilize cover crops and allow those cover crops to flower. They could simply allow weedy borders um, and allow those weeds to flower. Um, they could actually plant uh, strips of flowers that are attractive to pollinators or um, inside the fields, and these would be not permanent. Or they could um, create permanent hedgerows and flower gardens. So this, as you can see, is a least complex to most complex kind of arrangement, least commitment to most commitment of resources and of land in particular. And similarly for nesting resources, they might be able to just tweak some practices like um, moving from <coughs> flood irrigation to <coughs> drip or spray irrigation, which would be better for ground nesting bees. Um, trying to have no till, at least on some portions of their farm, which also would be good for ground nesting bees or leaving some areas of bare soil where bees can nest, leaving some trees, um, or putting actually putting up nest blocks for bees that nest in holes, and then practicing um, using a, a suite of best management practices for pesticide use. Um, and you can find a lot more detail about all of these and, uh, in this publication here. Um, so there are all these farm management <coughs> choices, and what we're trying to do with this model 
is really ask the question, um, would it be better to invest more in con conserving natural habitat or in restoring big blocks of it? Um, or might it actually be more cost effective to improve farm management at a site scale? Or what about some combination of those alternatives, which are the extremes? Um, we hope that through this work we'll be able to um, target which farmers might be most responsive to these approaches um, in space um, and also determine appropriate payments for environmental services such as the um, farm bill supports through <coughs> conservation programs. And um, just very briefly, uh, we've done a, a bit of work on these bee species and the plant resources that they need and this kind of information is, is being incorporated into existing uh, restoration projects. Um, farmers are interested in restoring riparian um, buffers um, and so this is a, a, a drainage ditch essentially and this is the beginning of a restoration project. I know it doesn't look like much but it was just a month ago. Um, and it will hopefully at some point be a, uh, a very beautiful uh, restoration, pro uh, riparian restoration. And we've been adding into the mix um, important plants for pollinators that <coughs> otherwise um, would leave them without early or late season resources. And then um, going along with this um, project of implementing these small scale restoration, um, we are monitoring the pollinator communities. Um, we're developing some citizen science monitoring approaches to incorporate um, uh, citizens into this monitoring and to get them involved. And we're also trying to monitor function as well as the community. So not just the diversity and abundance of bees, but what sort of function um, are we getting, what sort of pollination function are we getting out. And ultimately we hope to use this information to feed back to the economic model and to the public to show what the benefits of these approaches are. So I think I am just out of time. I'm going to skip these things. And thank you for inviting me to leave some time for questions. And that's actually, that's what I was trying to say in a bit of a rush at the end. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the problems is that we're going to do that for these um, restored riparian areas, but that's only one technique. And it would be ideal to be able to get, um, to do replicated studies of each of those techniques in isolation from one another to find out how cost effective each of them is. And we don't have the resources to do that. So right now we're just going to be able to do these, these are small scale projects and these are projects that farmers are doing anyway because they're interested in um, water management or for a variety of reasons they're doing them plus they're getting um, cost share funding. So it is um, really good that we're going to be targeting an activity that farmers want to do anyway. Um, <coughs> but we won't be able to get the detail on each of the different types of activity. We'll have to kind of make guesses. But it would be nice if other people would. It yeah. surely <laughs> would be nice, yeah. It would be great. Good question. Any others? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other than we have a break until two twenty, so it's more.